Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the third lecture in the Taking Action speaker series, Active Allyship in the Workplace, Making Anti-Racist Spaces for Workers and Communities with Sophie Williams. The discussion ahead of us promises to be engaging, thought-provoking, and timely. Across the province of BC, um, Canada, and beyond, I'm sure, across the globe, labor shortage persists. And so I'm really, really excited for the event we've got um, coming up for you. Within BC, it's clear that workers who are unemployed are not solely focused on the financial support a job offers. Employees are also looking for workplaces to offer something more fundamental, an equitable, anti-racist workplace. When we discuss equity, anti-racism, justice, decolonial practices, or any of these other themes addressed throughout the Taking Action speaker series, there's a fundamental need to speak to the importance and relationality that very much includes our relationship to lands and the waters that we're on. So before we move on any further, I'd like to introduce Mavis Underwood, who will be opening our session today. Mavis Underwood is of the Seut community from Saanich Nation. Her learning quest is to promote betterment of opportunities for First Nations and to influence needed social change, particularly in areas of education, human and social development, health and housing. She completed her BA in Child and Youth Care in 1978 and a professional teacher certification and certification in sexual abuse counselors training in the 80s. She then went on to complete her MA in Indigenous Governance in May of 2018 and is currently pursuing a PhD related to her accumulated knowledge, experience and teachings as a Hussainich woman. She is hoping to incorporate lived experience and the guidings and teachings to influence and refine intersections of Indigenous knowledge and history. It is my deep pleasure to welcome Mavis Underwood. Mm -hmm. Hi, Shka. Hi, Shka. Hela. That means uh, thank you, everyone, for joining in this important conversation today. I really am um, glad to be included in such a diverse, uh, rich audience. I think it's a very important discussion. You know, I've heard so many times uh, as I've moved from employment to employment um, that your place of work, you know, is kind of one identity you have and then your family life and everything else stays at home and it doesn't intrude. But the reality is um, we know that we're looking for a quality of life and you look for that match uh, in your employment, that fulfillment, the health, the safety, the extension, the extension of who you are. And a lot of my work um, has trying to be included, trying to be included as a distinct Indigenous First Nations woman. So in some cases, that means um, coming up against my own uh, systems of governance and leadership in our communities to express, you know, what we need as women, particularly what we need uh, for um, our children as we raise them up. We need good opportunities. We need those opportunities where we're free from harassment and bullying and stereotyping and uh, the negativity, the bad jokes that you just put away in the back of your brain, but it eats away at you. I think that those kind of harms um, are what keep people trying to move around in employment and never finding that rich fulfillment that they they could achieve um, and, uh, you know, achieve some of the personal goals that they want. And I worked in government at such a time uh, when um, Indigenous First Nations were being brought in because um, our voices were being requested, our experience was being requested but we had very little opportunity to influence um, policy and practice. There has been um, a really strong culture of public service at all levels of government, but particularly the federal and provincial governments that interface with Indigenous First Nations, families and communities. So it's been a real struggle to try to begin to change the underpinnings, the underpinnings of history, the underpinnings of policy, and the underpinnings of practice. And to do that, you actually need to have more and Indigenous persons there. So I think the, that kind of opportunity has taken me to many places beyond my traditional territory, Wasanich, Seout First Nation. We have quite a strong distinction here in Seout. We tested um, 
developers that came into our community who had been given per permits from the municipality and from the province to develop in our traditional marine territory. And because we had protected legal decisions, the Saanichton Bay Marina decision, we were able to put back a marina development and save our fishing rights. And for us, fishing rights is about um, a way of life as well. Being able to provide for yourself independently with the riches of the water is important. Being able to tell people about the injustice of having our fish traps outlawed, being um, forced off the water by um, provincial legislations or federal legislations, um, those kinds of things need to be brought forward. And I think this idea that you've brought brought um, taking action is really critical as we consider those significant actions under truth and reconciliation. What are those actions that are being demanded? And it really has to do with social change. How do we get everybody who is willing and able and wanting to achieve goals uh, to be able to participate in society in a rich and equal way, a, a really respectful way? And I know um, for myself, uh, the idea of taking action is is how I've worked. If it if it doesn't work for me, I I will often try to tease out another question. So I worked for a long time in education, and uh, and I still am in education. My my whole um, being really th thrives around those questions. Those questions that are agitating not only myself but Indigenous children, youth as they're in school. And uh, everybody who um, tries to learn from me, those things are really important to me that I have now become a mentor or a peer to scholars and we're changing um, the learning culture, the learning community. Um, and I think we can't do it fast enough. So I appreciate uh, what we're taught, the many hands to do the work. This forum is like that. This is about many hands, many minds working together. And so I really appreciate that. I appreciate the people that have been our advocates, have been our allies when we talk about murdered and missing women, murdered and missing children, um, sex exploitation of children, uh, the failure to recognize um, issues of uh, gender and uh, gender violence. And, uh, and I just, I need to apologize myself because I often don't recognize the pronouns sometimes that people are asking me to recognize and the reason why um, is I try to be a, a good human being and I get confused sometimes by attaching um, you know pronouns and I have been othered a lot you know those people those that's the way those people think about things that's their history it's not ours so so sometimes pointing that finger at it uh, is not a remedy for me. So I, I kind of get confused and I get struggled a little bit. So um, I just want to say um, I appreciate the patience with me as well. I'm aging and I'm trying to still be active and participate. I really want to thank you all for your attention. I want to thank you all for the efforts to recognize the history that underpins what we now know as colonial British Columbia. I want to thank everyone for the thoughts and the feelings and the words that come forward today, that you will be embraced by that special protection that we all ask for. And that's the heart and the spirits of our ancestors in the land to watch over us as we enter into a dialogue together today, that our words will not cause harm, that our thoughts and ideas won't cause harm, and that we will be able to do good work together always. For this and every day that we have to do that good work, I often offer up that special prayer of thanks. Each and every one of you. Thank you so very much, Mavis, for those grounding words, reflections, and your vulnerability as well, and truly outlining some of the core work and advocacy from Indigenous peoples that have come before we came into this space to address needed social change, but also outlining how much work still needs to be done. I'm honored to be in space with you, and I thank you for the work you have done and the work you continue to do. 
My name is Asiya Robinson. I use the pronoun she and her, and I was born and raised on a proportion of the traditional territories of the Arawak and Lucayan peoples, commonly known today as Grand Bahama Island, which sits within an archipelago of 700 islands known today as the Bahamas. These are lands and waters which I am connected to through ties that I can trace six generations back through my father's line and four known generations on my mother's matriarchal side. I am joining you today as a black settler on the traditional, unceded, and still occupied homelands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, on which I have the honor and responsibility to live, learn, and grow for the past eight years and more. Before we dive deeper into today's conversation, I'd like to note a few housekeeping items. We have closed captioning available on Zoom, so you can access it by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. If you require assistance at any time, please feel free to message privately hosts and panelists. And a huge thank you to our captioners from Accurate Real Time for providing this service. If you're joining us from the desktop or a laptop, you will notice that we have an ASL English interpretation. Thank you so much for being available today and keeping up with which I know will be a very fast paced but deep discussion. Thank you to these incredible interpreters. Please also note that this lecture is being recorded and will be available on the SFU Public Square website and YouTube channel after the event. If and when questions arise for you throughout the discussion, feel free to submit them to the speakers using the Q&A function at any point. We will do our best to get to as many of them as we can with the time left over. In the interest of keeping the space as safe as possible for all folks attending, please respect our community guidelines, which are posted on this slide and in the Zoom chat. Above all, there will be zero tolerance for those who promote violence or discrimination against others. Anyone who incites harm towards other participants in the chat will be moved at the discretion of the event hosts. As a visible Afro-Caribbean Muslim woman, the discussion today, active allyship in the workplace, is one that holds great personal importance. The Victoria Immigrant and Refugee Center Society, or VERCS, hosts two anti-racism initiative programs. The first is Resilience BC, a network funded by the Ministry of the Attorney General and made up of 35 nonprofit organizations doing work to stay connected and support information and training to prevent and respond to incidences of racism and hate in communities across what is colonially known as BC. You can learn more about the Resilience BC anti-racism network at their website. I am the program manager for the Leading Change for Resilient Communities, or LCRC, program, the other anti-racism initiative under VERCS. Our goal is to foster the reciprocal relationship between resilient, equitable communities and successful, sustainable businesses across rural BC. At our core, we believe that to overcome the impacts of widespread labor shortage in the province, employers need to grow their individual and collective comprehension of the social and economic impacts of colonial disruption, past and present, on systemic racism, and take an honest look at how those colonial impacts negatively influence current workplace practices and cultures. We invite you to learn more about the work that our program is doing, LCRC, on our mm -hmm. website. Across the province, many are dedicated to leading anti-racism initiatives, and some of those champions are joining us today, such as the Honorable Nikki Sharma. Nikki Sharma was elected MLA for Vancouver Hastings in 2020 and previously served as the Deputy Caucus Chair and Parliamentary Secretary for Community Development and Nonprofits. Nikki is a lawyer whose practice focused on representing Indigenous peoples, including residential school survivors. She's worked across BC as an advocate on climate policy and reconciliation and has been recognized for, recognized for her work on combating racism. She was elected to the board of Van City Credit Union, where she served as vice chair and chaired the Climate Justice Working Group. She's also served as chair of the Vancouver Board of Parks and Recreation. In these roles, she has worked to improve her community and make life better for people and our planet. In 2017, she also worked as a senior ministerial assistant, helping to deliver more childcare spaces for BC families. Nikki was raised in Sparwood, BC. She is a mother of two, and as she has lived in East Vancouver for more than 15 years, she has a truly deep connections with the community in that area. Please welcome the Attorney General and Honorable Nikki Sharma. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Asiya. It's so great to be here, and I want to thank you for the warm welcome, and I also want to thank Mavis uh, for those uh, powerful words. 
Um, as Asiya said, I'm Nikki Sharma, BC's Attorney General. My pronouns are she, her. I'm very happy to be joining you virtually today from the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. I want to start by thanking Sharon Thera of the Office of the BC Human Rights Commissioner, Resilience BC Anti-Racism Network, and Simon Fraser University for bringing us together to this event today. Um, it's just really great to see community and academia working together to advance anti-racism efforts. Uh, as Attorney General in this province, my job is to help make people help make life more fair for people and improve justice and equity across the province. So I have to say, I was sworn in um, on December 7th, a little over a month ago. Um, and I, I have this office now that has this years of history um, in this province. And every day it's not lost on me, those people um, that made the laws that harmed people operated out of that office and that there oh, over centuries there's or decades there's been people that, that have tried to find a voice um, within the attorney general's office to change things whether it was South Asian people that were fighting for the vote or you know newly um, new Chinese immigrants that were fighting for equal treatment under unions or indigenous people that for decades have been um, looking for reconciliation through offices like mine. Um, and you know as well as I do that colonial, colonization into institutional discrimination and systemic racism have been making life disproportionately harder for indigenous, black and people of color for generations. Um, I want you to know that those aren't just words to me about making changes, those are action items. Um, part of my mandate is to make sure that we continue the work of anti-racism in this province. And it's something that I'm deeply passionate about and have a very deep personal connection to. Um, as part of this work, the province recently announced um, a K-12 anti-racism action plan. It's a roadmap for getting anti-racism resources and guidelines into the hands of teachers, students, and families. And this plan includes changes to the provincial curriculum to support more Indigenous languages and more social justice courses for students. So children from all backgrounds can start to learn about diversity, equity, and inclusion while they learn the basics of math, art, and other important courses. Government is also working to address systemic racism, um, and it's one of our most important jobs, and that's within our programs and our services. Last year, in partnership with Indigenous people and racialized communities, we introduced the Anti-Racism Data Act, and it makes it possible for government to safely collect race-based data for the first time. Um, and with that data, we can identify where systemic racism is creating barriers for Indigenous, Black, and other racialized people who are using government supports and services. And this is so we can fix them and make our services better and work for everybody. And the next step of that is something that's within my work, which is to build on that, that piece of legislation to introduce broader anti-racism legislation that will require government to address systemic racism and racial inequality. Um, I truly believe that with the work of people like yourself um, and the commitment that myself and other of my colleagues have, BC is on the precipice of great change. Um, and I know that a lot of you are in the driver's seat of that change. Um, we're expecting more than a million job openings over the next decade. And with an incredibly tight labor market, we can decide together what businesses um, get money and how we want to earn a living. We can help shape the workforce based on needs and priorities. Um, we know diversity is our strength. Um, and the way we build our workforces, schools, and communities will separate people or bring them together. And I know so much great work is already happening in this area. The Resiliency Anti-Racism Network is helping make our communities a place that is uncomfortable for haters um, and discrimination. And the Office of the BC Human Rights Commissioner is doing great work in uncovering discrimination, inequality, and racism throughout our province. I want to thank you so much for everything you are doing for our province. Um, to help make it better today and for future generations. Um, and I wanna commend everyone online here today. By coming together, you're making a commitment to do better and make our communities better. I know that what you'll learn today here will serve you well. Um, and I just wanna thank you so much for, um, for all your work. Thank you so much, Nikki, and congratulations on your new appointment. I really look forward to the change you'll be continuing to champion within your role. I know it will be incredible. Next up, we have Samir Tarore, who is an anti-racism professional with management and program development experience and is SFU's first executive director of equity, diversity and inclusion. Before he came to SFU, Samir was at UBC, where he was the institutional initiative strategist in the equity and inclusion office. There, he co-developed and managed the institutional wide operation plan of UBC's inclusion action plan. 
a public educator, EDI consultant, and adjunct professor. Samir holds a PhD in sociology from McMaster University and is co-chair of the BC Multicultural Advisory Committee, which reports to BC's Attorney General and helps to shape the province's progress on anti-racism work, including the Anti-Racism Data Act, the first of its kind at a provincial or state level in North America. At SFU, Samir leads an established team of dedicated equity, diversity, and inclusion practitioners to create a diverse, equitable, and inclusive community where all can feel welcome, safe, accepted, and appreciated in their learning, teaching, research, and work. Welcome, Samir. Thank you very much for the invitation. I acknowledge that I am on the traditional lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, Sleotooth, Katsi, Coquitlam, Kaikat, Quentlin, Semiamu and Swasan peoples on whose unceded traditional territories that the three campuses of SFU reside on. As um, this is a packed agenda, I will be focusing solely on the actions pertaining EDI that um, a whole host of team and I, a whole host of folks and I across the university are working on. So let me start off by sharing my screen. Okay, so as, as I mentioned earlier on, um, the, the nature of this work really requires that we implement some sort of community or practice or some sort of network so that equity, diversity, inclusion work can happen across the various portfolios and the various units of the university. Um, as it's pretty common in universities for to be structured in a decentralized way. And so we've launched a community of practice uh, early December last year, of which to date there are 70 grow and, and growing number of people from across the three campuses who are helping with um, developing an integrated approach for advancing EDI in the university. Um, working across the silos is very important because it does help share the promising practices and prevent as much as possible um, what often happens when uh, different units work uh, in isolation, which is certain uh, activities are repeated that other people have done and have identified uh, the better ways to go about those EDI initiatives. So what are some of the EDI priorities here at SFU? I've broken down, I've, I've broken the priorities into a variety of buckets, including uh, strategic plans, which is what you see here. There are three strategic plans at SFU that we are in the process of aligning to or developing. One strategic plan is the, what we call the equity compass, AKA the EDI strategic plan. And for that, we've used a design, a co-design method in order to develop the priorities around EDI of the universities. We've had over 30 round table discussions. We've reviewed uh, 15 plus documents that are that capture the various ideas and opinions of SFU constituents when it comes to what they want to see uh, pertaining to EDI and uh, what type of barriers and experiences that they've had. So uh, we are in the process of developing SFU's first EDI a strategic plan, which is going to launch uh, in a couple of weeks from now. So please, on the please be on the lookout as the strategic plan has been informed by many people across the university, and there will be an opportunity for an entire month to be able to read the draft and provide your feedback and comments. So we're developing a strategic plan, which is major, and simultaneously. Uh, we are also responding or gearing up to respond to the BC's Accessibility Act. Uh, so what we have, we've launched an accessibility steering group that is developing recommendations for the uh, Accessibility Committee, which is a requirement through the BC Accessibility Act uh, that all institutions have to have an accessibility committee that are responsible for implementing 
the uh, recommendations in the VCs Accessibility Act. Um, and a fact to know is that 25% of VCs population age 15 and up have a disability. And as the population age and chronic illness become more common, um, it's, it's likely as well that more and more people will be living with disability as the years continue. The Scarborough National Charter on Anti-Black Racism and Black Inclusion. So SFU and a variety of other universities across Canada uh, are signatories to what is called, in short, the Scarborough Charter. And that ultimately serves as a resource for universities who want to address anti-Black racism and who want to affect positive change in the higher education sector. The Scarborough uh, Charter has also a lot of recommendations. And because we are a signatory here at SFU, uh, work is underway to um, uh, respond to the Scarborough Charter and make sure that we are in alignment to their calls to action. Uh, the second category or bucket of type of work we're doing pertains to EDI data. So we've officially launched an EDI data task force in uh, September of last year. And currently the EDI data task force is developing the, what we call ecosystem or structure for uh, administ uh, data administration and governance pertaining to EDI data. So um, the intention here is to launch SFU's first employment, e employment equity census, um, which seeks demographic information, but also launch a another survey that speaks to uh, more experiences around inclusion in the university so we, we can use that for a variety of decision making. We do have an interim demographic survey as well, won't really go into the details right now, but that was specifically developed in order to support um, uh, academic units who are in the process of doing preferential hiring of uh, Black candidates or, or and, and Indigenous candidates. Um, who want to do a preferential hiring and they need support to um, ask questions pertaining applicants' racial background. So that is also an initiative underway. Um, but very important to mention that when it comes to uh, Indigenous self-identification, uh, our Indigenous colleagues across SFU are in the process of developing the uh, SFU protocol for this specific purpose and for Indigenous constituents. Another bucket of work pertains um, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion within the employment life cycle. So special programs is a, is a programs of the BC Office of Human Rights Commission that enables organization to, in, uh, to do preferential and limited hiring. Now, when I say enable, it doesn't mean that organizations cannot do that prior going through the special programs application, but it does provide that extra set of eye um, and a legal perspective to ensuring that any attempts at preferential and limited hiring um, has the goal of equity, AKA positive discrimination uh, for some people who prefer that term. Um, so the, we, we uh, last year, SFU passed a motion, a Senate motion to conduct cluster hiring of at least 15 Black faculty, and uh, we are in the process of applying for a special programs in order to enable us and facilitate us to do that. Uh, employment life cycle review, so we're doing an analysis of the faculty and the staff life cycle, uh, the employment life cycle, everything that begins from uh, the process of recruitment all the way to that exit interview and uh, how do we also integrate um, uh, retirees of SFU within the broader commitment of EDI. So that is work that is underway and we will be um, implementing the recommendations stemming from the life cycle review. Uh, under these, the, the, the category of strategic initiatives is the variety of other types of priorities and types of work that we are doing. Uh, I won't go too much into the details. I'm mindful of the audience. Uh, here we have some very, very specific um, uh, uh, tasks that we're working on. But what I would like to draw your attention to is the critical equity and global crisis 
incidence response protocol. As you know, universities are not isolated entities, um, but uh, the population within a university are also part of a diaspora, um, and many people stem from many other parts of the world. So when there is a critical incident, such as the human rights crisis uh, happening in Iran, it does have a direct and indirect impact on certain populations within the university's uh, four walls. And so um, we, are, we are mindful that it's important to create protocols in order to support individuals who are part of a group that is going through a variety of crises. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. It really just sounds like there is no end to the amount of work that um, SFU is doing and you and your team is doing. And it really sounds incredible. I was really interested to hear about the work that you're doing really to support the diaspora um, from all these different communities, because what happens externally really does affect communities internally. So thank you so very much. Next, and, and probably finally on my list, I would like to introduce um, Sharon. Sharon Athira is the Executive Director of Education and Engagement at British Columbia's Office of the Human Rights Commissioner. She has focused much of her work on equity issues, first in developing suicide prevention programs for youth and adults, then as Executive Director for the Indi Indian Residential School Survivor Society, where she developed response and treatment programs for residential school survivors. Through her learnings from survivors, she participated in the development of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and moved on to work in Indigenous health research at UBC and the Indigenous Education and Engagement at New Brunswick Community College. She's interested in the interplay between individual and collective responsibility, as well as the ways that history of social systems can inform our response to the intense polarization in British Columbia. She believes that change can happen quickly and that every member of society has a role to play in sustaining the gains we make. She is the proud mother of a strong daughter and a stepdaughter. And while she adopted through Halalt First Nations on Vancouver Island, she is indigenous and of mixed race from South America. Please help me to welcome the amazing Sharon. Thank you so much, Asaya, for a lovely introduction. And now, folks, on to the main event. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to invite you to just give your shoulders a quick stretch uh, in a shrug and let you know that I'm joining you from Nuklelaquam in Squarish Territory waters. And that doesn't mean that I'm bobbing in the middle of the ocean with my cell phone held above my, my head. I'm actually on a little island off of Vancouver called Bowen Island. I bring you warm greetings from Kasari Govinder, who is BC's Human Rights Commissioner. And having just released an important employment equity resource, she's keenly interested in this topic today and sends you her very warm greetings. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce the spirit lifting and wonderfully disarming Sophie Williams. Um, Sophie will take us on a journey of allyship in the workplace. Before she does that, I wanted to just share a couple of reflections with you. And one of these is that when you really think about it, we spend about 30% of our waking time at work every single week, 30% of our time, which means that we see our colleagues at work more than the special people that we live at live with sometimes. And so it makes sense that when we're thinking about change, when we're talking about change, that the workplace can be important, an important place for us to start building the society that we want. Um, I've been watching, I know none of you do this, but uh, lately I've been watching TV and I've been watching a late 60s TV show, which was a, for a, a front runner in terms of civil rights at the time. It was a young unmarried woman living on her own uh, back in the late 60s. And, and in one of the episodes, she uh, demonstrated unconscious bias in a really clear and concise way. It showed us assumptions that she made about a young black boy who had a candy bar in a store. And it was refreshing to know that back in the 60s that they were bringing forward these notions about um, unconscious bias at the time. But the episode ended, it ended with little comment uh, about unconscious bias. And in the next episode, the world went back to the way that it was before. 
And so what we know about what happened and what has happened over time is that while we ha keep having these lessons, we keep learning these lessons, we, are, we become aware of them. As powerful as they are, awareness is not enough. We need to translate awareness into action. And that is what Sophie Williams is offering us today. She's inviting us to be anti-racist allies. In human rights language, we talk about human rights, but human rights also convey the notion that we carry responsibilities to uphold the rights of others. As allies, that is our responsibility, to uphold the rights of others. You've come here to hear Sophie today because she's an expert in the field of diversity, equity, and inclusion. She's the author of Anti-Racist Ally, which is a wonderful piece of work. It is concise and simple and direct in its approach. And I encourage you to bring it into your workplace and use it as a ongoing conversation guide within uh, your circle at work. Uh, Sophie's a TED speaker. She's founder of the at official Millennial Black Instagram page and an inter intersectional equity consultant for several businesses in the UK. She speaks regularly as a panelist and as a consultant, and she facilitates workshops in anti-racism, diversity, inclusion, allyship. And through her talks, she encourages people to take their first steps of their own activism or allyship journeys, or to build their existing foundations to truly build equality into their personal and working lives. The intersection between the public and the private life is where Sophie is challenging us. And so um, without further ado, I would like to bring Sophie to you uh, and, in, and have her jump into this journey that we wish to take together. At the end of the session, we may or may not have time for questions, uh, but if we do, uh, I will be curating them through the Q&A function that you have at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So please feel free to pop your questions in uh, while Sophie's talking, and we will see if we have time at the end of the session. So I'd like you to join me in an ASL welcome of applause for Sophie Williams. Thank you. Oh, I love this. Um, what an um, amazing event to be allowed and invited to be a part of and included in. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to do everyone's favorite part of virtual working, which is sharing my screen and crossing my fingers that it works. So two seconds. Click that. There we go. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for having me as part of your session. I'm Sophie Williams and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm looking forward to spending the next little while with you. And I will say, I will introduce myself properly in a minute, but I want to be really clear from the get-go. I am based in the UK. That's where I live. That's where I work. So that is the perspective that I bring to my work and to this presentation. But I hope that it's still an interesting insight into the conversations and the work that's happening in England. And as Sharon said, um, hopefully we will have time for Q&A at the end um, where Sharon and our other fantastic speakers can help us have a more um, Canadian and British Columbian focused um, lens on the conversation. Off to a good start. Um, so I think things are always better when you know what to expect. And so here's a quick breakdown of what we're going to get up to together today. Um, it's, I think, your lunchtime, if you're based in Canada, um, it's the very end of my day. And so we're on slightly different energies, but we're going to meld it together and make it work. Also, this is the my first uh, public talk of the year, I think. And so we're also going to work together to make that great. So I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about who I am and why I'm speaking to you, what gives me sort of the access to the space. We will then talk about what allyship is and what intersectionality is, because I think in this work so often the terms that we use that are meant to be helpful and bring us all together can actually be roadblocks. If no one explains to you what we mean when we say these words, then we don't have the correct opportunity to collaborate with one another. And so I'm going to go through these two terms that I think are really foundational to the work. Those two pieces are really quite ephemeral. They're very sort of foundation laying. Um, and I think it's really useful to then talk about something that's a bit more actionable, a bit more tangible. So I'm going to then talk about the race and gender pay gap um, and how 
those um, theories that we talk about actually play out in people's lived experience. We'll then go back to why we need allies, and then we'll go to a um, actionable set of tools and tips and techniques that we can use to be an ally in our workplace, but also throughout our, our communities and throughout our lived experience day to day. So we're going to be spending this time together. It's only correct that I introduce myself properly. I'm Sophie Williams. I use she, her pronouns. I'm based in London, England. I'm the author of two books, Anti-Racist Ally and Millennial Black. I'm a TED speaker, and where I really work is in the combination of womanness and blackness. And that's going to be really framing our conversation today. Before I started doing this work, I was a COO and CFO of London advertising agencies, and I'm also ex-Netflix. I left Netflix, I guess, in the middle of last year after leading the European walkout in protest of anti-trans content. So that's who I am, that's sort of the foundation of what I believe and what grounds all of my work and practice. So what I wanna do first is quickly zoom through allyship, what it is and why it's really important that we're all on the same page before we get going on this work. So I feel like allyship has really become a word that we've started using and seeing a lot more in the last few years. And that might be partially my fault. Um, but there have been, I think, some misunderstandings along the way about what we really mean when we use the word ally. So I think we should just spend a couple of minutes setting the record straight on the concept, because I think much too often, we're seeing ally being used as a passive word, as something that you can think or feel or believe. And I think it's really important that we all know allyship cannot work that way. Allyship is a verb. Allyship only exists in action. It is not passive. Allyship is active. Allyship is not a belief. Allyship is what you do for the good of other people. And as well as making the mistake of thinking that allyship can be achieved through thought rather than in action, the other main mistake I see people making when they first engage with allyship is viewing it as an internal rather than an external pursuit. A lot of people seem to think about allyship in terms of what it means for them or about them. People want to see it as a personal branding exercise or a personal improvement exercise, a chance to show how good you are. I want to say the word woke, but I don't think we use that anymore, but you know what I mean. A chance to show just what a good person you are and position yourself. But that's not what allyship is. Allyship isn't about you. And that's, I think, the crux. Because allyship is about recognizing your privileges and using them to speak out and make change on behalf of those who do not have those same privileges with the aim of making a better society and environment for us all. Because allyship is speaking up, it's standing up, it's joining the fight and the struggle for equality for all. And I say the fight because it really is. Allyship is rarely, if ever, a one-time solution. Instead, it's an ongoing struggle for the equity and the rights of others. And it's really important to know that because there is no quick fix here. There is no next Thursday, we have solved this. And if you really want to be an ally, you need to continue to apply pressure and to push for change. This is the most important thing. As an ally, your job is to make change. And when we realize that we're defined by our actions, that we're working on behalf of other people and we're not working on our own personal branding, then we can really start to encapsulate allyship in this way. So I'm gonna reiterate it. As an ally, your job is to make change. And you do that in your actions, not in your thoughts or in your beliefs, but in the actual active actions that you put into the world. So it's a lot of information to take on. So too long didn't read what is allyship. Allyship is recognizing your privileges and it's using them to make the world a better place for other people. 
So that is the whistle-stop tour of allyship. And I think we also need to make sure that we're all on the same page about intersectionality. So intersectionality is the longest word to try to fit into a presentation or into a book, and it will mess up all of your formatting. And so if I didn't have to talk about it, if I didn't think it was essential, I wouldn't. But I really do not think that we can be good allies without an understanding of intersectionality, what it is and why it matters. So we're going to do the same whistle-stop tour as we did for allyship with intersectionality. So when I first start talking about allyship, a lot of people say what's on this slide. They say, it sounds pretty simple to me. We should just treat everybody exactly the same. We should just be colorblind when it comes to race. And whilst I recognize that's well-intentioned, it is absolutely not the way forwards. In the same way that we don't best ally with, work with or support somebody who's using a wheelchair by telling them, I don't see wheelchairs, and insisting on treating them exactly the same, telling them to climb the stairs alongside us. We don't best ally with racially marginalized people by being or claiming to be colorblind. We best ally with support and work with our marginalized friends and colleagues by understanding what their challenges are and working together to understand them. And this is where intersectionality comes in. So intersectionality is a term that was coined by black feminist thinker Kimberly Cranshaw in 1989. And essentially intersectionality recognizes that we are all made up of a huge number of different facets. That could be our race, our gender identity, our physical ability, our class, neurodivergence, and so many other things. But we know when we think about ourselves that all of these things are fundamental to our own identity. They're fundamental to everyone's identity and to the ways that society treats them. And in our society, there are some identities such as whiteness, maleness, heterosexuality, and they've historically been perceived as the norm, as the expected baseline that we all start from. And so they've been perceived as being good and they have been uplifted. But there are other identities like blackness, brownness, womanness, transness, queerness, and they've been seen as other or as deviant or as bad. And so they have been put at a disadvantage by society. What intersectionality shows us is that these societal differences don't cancel each other out. Blackness doesn't cancel out transness, for example. Instead, what we see is these identities, they overlap. They layer on top of each other. Instead of canceling each other out, they stack up and they create reinforcements of marginalization. Because we can't just pull out one part of people. We know that we have to understand them as a whole. And this is what this beautiful image that I found on Google, <laughs> on Google Images, I didn't even draw this, um, but I think it really represents what I'm trying to talk to you about here. Because once we understand intersectionality, we can begin to understand that marginalized people can often be fighting oppression on multiple fronts simultaneously. As Audre Lorde said, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. None of us are one dimensional. And to best ally with, support and collaborate with people, we have to recognize that instead of denying it or overlooking it. So too long didn't read, what is intersectionality? Intersectionality recognizes that we are all made up of a number of different facets, which overlap rather than canceling each other out. And those intersections, they impact how society sees us and treats us. And that impacts on all of our lived experiences as we move through the world. So I'm aware that up to now, the focus has been quite ephemeral. We've been talking in quite conceptual foundational terms. We've been talking about what things mean in theory. But I think it's really useful for us to also have a real world example of what happens when these things stop being theoretical and start touching real people's lives. And so I'm gonna do that 
by looking at a case study of the race and gender pay gaps. With this, we'll see how intersectionality comes into play and we can really see the real world implications of unequal workplaces. I've chosen in this to focus on black women's working experiences because that's what I can best speak to personally and that's been the main area of my research and of my writing. It's also really UK and US heavy, which I'll touch on as we go through. So let's start with some stats about where we are now. American women are paid on average 82 cents for every dollar that white men are paid. I recently updated this presentation and I went back to check on this stat. When I was first doing my research for my book, that figure was 80 cents. So that was a nice discovery. That's a two cent closure, but it's still a really big gap. And I feel like we hear stats like this a lot. But when we hear these stats, what I think we don't hear is the fact that this is an aggregated average. And we've got to this average by lumping all women together into a single group of womanness without having an eye to intersectionality. And it's no wonder that that's how we get our data because that's how businesses are currently required to gather and report on these figures. This data for me exists because companies in the UK and the US that are over a certain size are required to report on their gender pay differences each year. But what they're not required to do is to report on their race pay difference data. And so that means from the get-go, we lose a huge chunk of the story. And the sad thing is we're gonna to continue to lose that story, at least in the UK, and maybe to an even greater extent. And that's because in 2020, it was hoped that businesses would start to be required to do the same level of reporting on race pay gaps as they do on gender pay gaps. But COVID unfortunately actually meant that the legal requirement to do any pay gap reporting, whether it's race or gender, was completely suspended in the UK. And it hasn't come back since. So that means instead of getting the richer, more intersectional data that we were hoping for, we're actually going to face a full two or maybe even three or more years additional gap in the data that we already had. So what does happen when we take a more intersectional view? To get the real stories, we need to dig deeper into the data that is available. We need to split median salaries by race as well as gender, and then we can get a better idea of the conversation that's been lacking until now. So when we add race into the conversation, we can see from this lean in research that black women on average get paid only 58 cents for every dollar that white men are paid in the US. And now, as I said, I recently updated this presentation and I was really pleased with the stat on the previous um, slide showing that closing gap from 80 to 82. But I do also need to tell you that when I first started this piece of research, this stat was 62 cents for every dollar. So whilst women as a whole could be said to have closed some of their gap, it doesn't seem to be benefiting all women equally. And in fact, for black women at least, that gap has actually widened or become worse instead of closing and getting better. <clears throat> I will share a link to the um, sources that are used for my stats throughout this because I'm aware that this can be jarring for some people when they first hear it. So you can have a look at that and you can fact check for yourself. So you can check my sources. But what we can see is when we take an intersectional view, the story really starts to open up in front of us. Suddenly, we can see a 42% pay gap between black women and white men, which we might never have spotted before. But we can also see a 21% pay gap between black and white women, which is absolutely lost when we take the homogenous view of women as a whole group that we're so used to seeing. When we lump all women into one and don't consider intersectional identities, we overlook the groups who need the most support. So what does this additional gap actually mean for black women in their working lives? If you want to think about it in group terms, 
It means that black women have to wait, and by wait, I mean work, an additional 72 years for our equal pay day, 2130. That's an incredibly long time. If you wanna take it out of the group and into the individual, it means that a, a single black woman would need to work until she was 86 to close the gap in earnings with her white male colleague who was able to retire at 60. Last year in 2022, black women's equal pay day was on September 21st, meaning that black women on average needed to work an additional nine and a half months to close the earnings gap with white men who on average were able to earn the same amount in the 12 months of 2020. The year before, Black Women's Equal Pay Day was in August. So August in 2021, September in 2022. Again, we do sadly seem to be losing ground again, year on year. And I think when we're just talking about things in terms of pennies or cents, it can seem insignificant. I mean, what is a few pence, who cares? But in reality, it really adds up. It adds up a lot and it adds up quickly. When we look at the average um, gap over a 40 year career, we can see that we end up with an earnings loss for the average black woman of almost a million dollars. That is a huge deficit. That is a huge penalty to pay for nothing more than being both black and female at work. And I mean, obviously not, this is obviously not what we want. This is absolutely, this is nonsense. So why is this happening? Clearly this isn't a good story. And I think knowing what is happening without knowing some whys is a bit, it's not that useful. So let's talk about not only what's going on, but what some causes are and what some causes are not. Lean In is a really great data source. They're American, and so the majority of the data that they use and share is also American. But because they have spent so much time researching and have broken people down into individual intersectional groups by race and gender, which is so rare, they give us an almost unique opportunity to see in a more intersectional way what's actually going on. So what we can see here is that from the very start of black women's careers, we're at a disadvantage. When we start off our working lives with a pay gap, we make a deficit that many of us are never able to close throughout the course of our careers. And that's especially true in businesses, workplaces, institutions, where pay rises are given as a capped percentage increase on an existing salary. In fact, what we see is that that gap, instead of closing, only continues to grow and widen. Again, this does show some improvements. The entry level gap for black women used to be 21% and for um, 25 to 54 year olds, it used to be 32%. So we are seeing some narrowing. We're seeing some closing of the gap here. But the gap has actually widened with our oldest demographic. Here we can see that black women over 55 years old are currently tracking at a 39% pay gap, according to Lean In, where their data previously showed this gap at 37%. So something is still happening to black women at the end of their careers, at what we would hope would be the highlight at the, the peak financial moment in their careers, we're actually seeing the pay gap at the widest as it, that it is at any other point in their working lives. A lot of people make the argument that women and black women are not progressing at the same rate as their male colleagues because they're just not leaning in to the same degree. They're not asking for what they deserve. And that's a tricky conversation. Like I've said, I really like lean in as a data source, but it is lean in. And so it really advocates for people leaning in, advocates for them using their voice and asking for what they deserve. And that's great advice. But that's much more difficult if you are part of a marginalized group like black women that is classified as being angry or aggressive when you use your voice. In those instances, that can be really difficult advice to follow. 
But regardless, we can see that black women are in fact, according to this data, leaning in. They are asking for and trying to neg negotiate pay rises and promotions at the same rate or even more than black, sorry, than white men and white women. But they're just not hearing yes to anything like the same degree. Other people argue, hold on. Yes, sorry, my computer jammed for a minute, but we are back on the we're back on the road. Um, other people argue that there's an educational deficit. They presume that non-white people are less educated. And they just say, if we can only close the educational gap, then we will close the pay gap. I don't know if they are well-intentioned or not, but what I can tell you is it's not true. It's not true at all. In America, where this data comes from, black women are the group who achieve the largest number of bachelor's degrees. And as we can see, the pay gap actually widens as black women become better educated. And as we can see here, the race and gender pay gap for women is at its widest for those black women who do have a bachelor's degree. And that's followed closely by those with an advanced degree. So those people who suggest that black women should be able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, should be able to educate themselves out of this discrepancy, we can see here that it's not true. Those gaps only continue to grow the more educated a black woman becomes. There are still other people who argue that the issue is occupational segregation. They don't usually call it occupational segregation. Instead, what they usually say is black women and white men just tend to do different jobs. They don't talk about why that might be, um, but they just say that the types of job that white men tend to do just happen to be better paid. When we look at it, we look at this snapshot this is comparing people in the same jobs, the same fields, the same industries, the same work types. And we can see that that attitude doesn't really hold true. We still see the same pay gap by race and gender intersectionally. So you might be thinking, this is obviously bad, but it's not us. Sadly, it is a pretty universal issue. Um, as I say, I'm based in the UK. So to use the UK as an example, this data on this slide is comparing graduates from the same universities with the same degrees and the same degree outcomes. And what we can see here is pretty much the same in terms of the compounding impact of race and gender together. White male graduates out earned white female graduates and they both deeply out earned black female graduates in the UK, according to the Office of National Statistics. And as I say, this isn't just an issue that black women face. As you can see here, everyone who isn't both white and male pays a tax for their intersections in comparison to white men. It's not just that. We can also see in the UK that BAME young people are the most likely to be unemployed. I don't like the word BAME at all. Um, in case anyone doesn't know, it's B-A-M-E. It stands for Black. Asian minority ethnic. And the reason I don't like it is I feel like it really centers whiteness. There is white and then there is BAME. If you're not white, everyone else is put into this catch all term of BAME and treated as a single entity in a single experience. Whilst I don't like this term, almost all UK policy and academic research is framed in this way. And so that means when you come to try to find data, you're limited by that term. And so I end up needing to use it. I think BIPOC is probably the um, similarity that you have. Um, what we can see here is that those BAME young people who are in work are much more likely to be on insecure contracts. And they're much more likely to need to have a second job in order to supplement their income to make it to a livable standard of income for themselves. I hope it doesn't take a business case to get people invested in this, but in case it does, there were several really good ones. Um, for example, we all know that an engaged workforce is a productive workforce. And when talking about the workplace, 72% of Gen Z say that race equality is the most important issue today. 
I think in the same way that millennials were overlooked for a long time, people are overlooking Gen Z. The oldest millennials are approaching their 40s. I think the oldest millennials might be 40 now. The oldest Gen Z are approaching their 30s. These people are not the future of the workforce. Think about your colleagues, think about the people who you respect, think about your team, think about your managers. This is not the future of work, this is the current of work. And we have to pay attention to what these groups and demographics need and care about and say is important because we need people to continue to want to choose us. We need people to continue to want to choose our businesses. And if we don't adapt and take on board the things that matter to them, then they won't continue to choose us and our businesses will not continue to be successful. The next point is more diverse teams perform better. They just make more money, they are more successful. So if a business is asking why we need allies or why they should care about this, the business benefit is pretty clear. The companies that are in the top quartile for gender and ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to have financial returns above their respective national industry medians. And that's in comparison to those who are only in the top quartile for gender diversity, who are just 15% more likely to outperform their industry medians. And diversity in the workplace is particularly advantageous at the most senior levels. This is important because often businesses make tokenistic hires at inexpensive junior levels, but they don't make the same investment in developing or promoting that talent up through the business, which goes some way to explain the widening gap as black women age through their careers because they progress in businesses more slowly with less financial reward, less regularly than their colleagues. But having representation at a more senior level gives marginalized people a chance to have a voice and a say in business decisions, which makes the business more valuable. I think we all know what it's like to be junior in a business and we feel scared and intimidated and we can't believe we're even there. And so we're never going to stand up and say, I think this, could, this would resonate better with my community. I think this, or I think that. When we have people who are more senior, they are freer to use their voices. They feel more empowered. They feel the value that their diversity of lived experience and opinion can share. And so companies with 10% higher gender and racial diversity on management teams and boards had 5.8% higher EBITs in the UK and 1.1% higher EBITs in the UK, sorry, in the US. Your EBIT is your earnings before interest and tax and is essentially the measure of annual profitability and value of your business. So too long didn't read what is the race and gender pay gap. The race and gender pay gap is intersectional disadvantage in action. People are paid less because they are part of two marginalized groups, even though race and gender diversity together are good for business. So hopefully that's given you some insight into one small area of what we're working with and why things aren't working. So on to allyship. What's the deal with it? Why do we need it? We need it because the current landscape is uneven and unfair. This is um, part of a report made by the Conservative government in um, 2020 in the UK. And they found that there is discrimination and bias at every stage of an individual's career, and even before it begins. From networks to recruitment, and then the workforce, it's there. Fame, the government loves saying fame. Fame people are faced with a distinct lack of role models they are more likely to perceive the workplace as hostile and they are less likely to apply for and be given promotions and they are more likely to be disciplined or judged harshly. All too often, people who are suffering the most prejudice or injustice have been kept by structural and institutional racism out of positions of power when they have the opportunity, means and resources to make real, meaningful, long-term change. And so that's when we need you. That's when we need our allies, our friends, our champions and our supporters. We need you to look around the rooms that you have access to and to really pay attention to who else is in those spaces and who isn't. 
If the makeup of the team inside your office is not representative of the makeup of the people that you see outside of your office doors, then there is a problem. There is something that is keeping the widest range of people out or meaning that they don't feel like they can stay once they get in. We need you to notice that. We need you to see who is there and who isn't, and we need you to care. I'm gonna hand over very quickly to Rihanna for a word on this. I'm gonna pop on um, subtitles as well. So one second. Okay. Imagine being Rihanna, like, what is that like? <laughs> She's incredible. So I know she doesn't say the word ally in that, but I think that's exactly what she's talking about. There is no your problem, there is no my problem, there are our problems, and together we can sort them out. So let's go. We've done the groundwork, but what can you actually do to step into your allyship and to be part of making change? Let's talk about some ways that you can bring anti-racist allyship into your working life and into your daily practice. <clears throat> With allyship, the best first step is to look at yourself and to understand your starting point. By which I mean, take stock of yourself as an individual, intersectional person. Recognize which elements of yourself have been uplifted and which have been marginalized. This can be hard to do. It's going to be intimidating, but it really is the most important first step, I think. So I'll start with me, so then maybe it's easier for you. Although I'm Black and a woman, that doesn't mean that I don't have any areas where I don't have to struggle. I absolutely do, and those are my privileges, and those are the things I can use to uplift others. Some of my privileges are I am able-bodied, I never need to worry about being able to physically access the spaces that I need or want to, to live a full life. I don't need to plan routes in advance. I don't need to worry about access or spaces that I need to be in before I get there. I never have to have that additional cognitive burden. I'm heterosexual. I have no problems, issues or concerns walking down the road holding hands with my partner. I don't need to worry about what the perception will be of my relationship as I move through the world. I'm cisgendered. I don't face the risk of violence or aggression for the ways that my gender is displayed or perceived as I move through the world. I never have to make any plans, take any precautions around the perception or acceptance of my gender identity. I never have to have that additional worry or concern. I'm light-skinned. As a black woman, I'm mixed race and I have this incredible proximity to whiteness. I am incredibly light-skinned. In a society that uplifts and values whiteness, this is an advantage, this is a privilege. It shouldn't be, and none of these other things should be either, but they are. All of these things and so many others are things that I didn't do anything to earn. I didn't work for them, I don't deserve them, they're just the luck of my draw. And if we can agree that not having to worry about these elements is a privilege, then I think we can also agree that having to worry about them every day as we move through the world is a disadvantage, which people also did nothing to earn or to deserve. I encourage you to spend a little bit of time taking personal inventory, seeing the elements of yourself that are uplifted versus those that are marginalized. Take these privileges and look for ways that you can address the areas of your life to uplift others. The next thing I want people to do as they start their allyship thoughts is to get ready and get comfortable making mistakes. You need to get comfortable knowing that you will make mistakes. And by that I mean not knowing that you might make them, but knowing that you absolutely will do. You have to get comfortable with that. You will make mistakes, especially if you're new to this, especially 
I mean, even if you are sure that what you're doing is right, even if you have all of the greatest intentions, you will make mistakes because this conversation is deep and important and emotional and full of history. We are never going to get everything exactly right first time, especially if we're learning. What I want us to do is when we make a mistake, we can't make a big deal about it. Because what we do when we do that, when we hurt someone and then look to them for forgiveness, we're giving them the emotional burden. We're giving the marginalized person who we've done a damage to the burden of comforting us, of saying, I know, I know, you're a good person, don't worry about it. At the end of last year, I misgendered someone who I really care about. And I really wanted to just say, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I would never do that. You know I care about you, you know I respect you, and like really just spiral and ask them to help me, ask them to save me, ask them to comfort and reassure me and say that you know I'm a good person. But that's not what I can do in that moment because I am the person who has hurt them. As much as I want to lay all of my cards out and ask for forgiveness, what I have to do is say, I'm sorry, I really respect you. I would never want to do that to you. I will try my hardest to make sure that never happens again. All of the other feelings are for me, they're not for them. So when you make a mistake in this conversation, which is emotional, acknowledge that mistake, say you're sorry, keep it moving, and try not to make the same mistake twice. In businesses, I want you to think beyond recruitment. I want you to understand that this is not a numbers game. Hiring diversely is important and it has a big business benefit, but it's the start, it's not the end. Do not bring people from marginalized groups into hostile or unequal environments. We spend a lot of time talking about businesses and asking them to diversify their hiring pool. And this is important, but it is very much step one. We have to understand what it's like when marginalized people are brought in in ways that feel tokenistic. To continue our conversation around black women, they more than any other group leave full-time employment once they are in, to, in order to start their own businesses because they report finding the working environment hostile, they realize they're not getting pay rises or promotions at the same rate as other groups. They've been brought in, but their employers have failed to think beyond recruitment. And I will say, I know that quitting your day job and starting your own business can sound really cool, but um, that is until we realize that these businesses can't access funding very easily. In fact, only about 0.06% of VC funding goes to black female owned businesses. So these women have left their jobs because they feel that they've hit a concrete ceiling in regards to promotions and pay rises and opportunities, only to take a bet on themselves and to go out on their own and find more of the same difficulties. Do not feel that your job is done once someone is in the door. Instead, make sure that you've created an inclusive environment and an even footing for promotions, pay rises and retention. It is much, much easier and less expensive than having to recruit and retrain and backfill constantly. Create environments where people feel expected, respected and protected. No one wants to be in a space where they feel like they're just being tolerated or feel like they're an afterthought. We need to include inclusion, diversity and belonging from the very beginnings of forging our culture. You might know the quote from my old Netflix colleague, Bernay Mayers, who said, diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being invited to dance. I don't think I quite agree because I think in both of these situations, being invited to the party and being invited to dance, we're waiting for someone else to issue that invitation, to give us permission to be in those spaces and to take part. I think we can push this further. I think we can push this to striving to create working environments where people feel expected, protected and respected. Expected means that we don't see someone from a marginalized group on their first day and direct them to use a side door like happened to Edward Antle on his first day as editor-in-chief of British Vogue. We don't see someone in that space and give them our coffee order or expect them to take notes because we expect them and people like them to be present in the roles and, that they've earned. 
This happened to me so much when I was a chief operating officer. People would come for meetings or interviews and automatically give me their coffee order. They'd say, I'll just wait here until the people are ready. And I'd have to say, I am the people and this isn't going very well. Um, we have to expect people in the positions that they're in. The next element is respected. Respected means having more than the message we tolerate you. It means being sure of equal access and opportunities and making people feel safe and included. Making people know that they are valuable team members and making sure other team members, clients, partners know that this is a minimum requirement for being part of our work. And finally, protected, because even the best laid plans and intentions can go well. So we need to protect our community and our team members by having clear, transparent and available steps that they can take should expected and respected fall short. We should um, not expect people from marginalised groups to be a monolith. When we hire tokenistically and we bring in single people, we make them onlys. The only person in the team, in their department, in the role, in the business, in the office, in the building, who looks like them. This is a huge pressure. It creates the feeling that this person goes from being an individual to being a representative of their entire group. It takes away the individuality that other groups have afforded. It also creates a huge fear of failing because it feels like any mistake that you make not only reflects badly on you, but on the whole group that you've become an unintended spokesperson and face for. And that is a huge burden to carry. It's also not good for your business. Women who are onlys are twice as likely to be subject to sexual harassment and are 150% more likely to think about leaving their jobs. And that takes us back to that recruitment um, retention conversation. The next thing is to be aware of coded aggression and microaggressions. Racism has changed. It's more discreet, it's more coded, it's harder to pin down and take to HR, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. And it doesn't mean it's not as dangerous and as harmful as it always has been. It can be easy to write off microaggressions, it's not a big deal, I mean they've got micro in the name, but before we write them off, let's take a moment to understand them. I'm going to share another video with you which I think sums it up really well. Rihanna isn't in it, but hopefully you can forgive me. For people who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem, Oh, you're so well spoken. Oh, just imagine instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. Oh. Mosquito bites and our itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while, no, where are you really from? Uh Cleveland. Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. Whether it's on a date. Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just buying apples. Commuting to work. So when are you going to have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the Redskins' name. It's part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. I couldn't even tell you were gay. <sighs> Mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. You know, John, shopping is so bad. I'm sure too. And getting bit by mosquitoes every goddamn day. Can I touch your hair? Multiple times a day. Pretty, can, can I, I touch it? Hair? It's fine. Oh, 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 I know. That makes you want to go ballistic on those mosquitoes. It's like a huge overreaction to people who only get bit every once in a while. It's just a mosquito bite. Who cares? Just another angry black woman. Of course, beyond just being annoying, some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm. Maybe you should try this challenging major. Ow. Oh, what a dream. And other mosquitoes carry strains that can even kill you. It looked like you was up to trouble, okay? I felt threatened. So next time you think so reacting, just remember, some people experience mosquito bites. <laughs> all the time you're also exotic wow and by mosquito bites we mean microaggression yeah okay so we don't have so long so i'm going to really zoom through these last couple and um, the next thing i want to say is do not put the burden of making change onto already marginalized groups I see this happening in businesses and in organizations all the time, and it really drives me bananas. 
So often businesses set up DNI committees or ERGs, and those groups are normally run by volunteers. And those volunteers are largely from the marginalized groups that they, that they represent. This is an additional burden that these groups take on, on top of their existing workloads, which means that they're taking on additional tasks which benefit the business for no additional pay. This is what's known as office housework. It's very often not rewarded or taken into account when it comes to conversations around pay rises or promotions. And this is doubly bad because working on this overworked, undervalued type of work means that these already marginalized people have less time and capacity to take on what's known as glamour work. They are high profile tasks that the business values and gives them the opportunity to, to mingle with more senior people, normally in revenue driving activities. You can help with this if you're not from a marginalized group. You can help by joining these groups, these committees and ERGs and pushing to keep these conversations regular and relevant in your business. In senior people, I am particularly looking at you. If you want these conversations to be successful, you have to invest in them. You have to do more than self-congratulate on having a network, having an ERG. You have to make sure that it's funded, that it's supported, and that concrete aims are put in place and met, just like they would be for any other important business area. People often tell me that they are too small to make change or they're too junior or too new or too isolated. I really want you to look at the power and recognize the power of the group. When you're vocal about who you are and what you believe in, people who are like-minded find their way to you, they're drawn to you. And together, you can work on strategies and tactics to make real change. Because when businesses see an ongoing and widespread investment and commitment from their teams, they are much more likely to take those areas of interest seriously and to make change. The next thing I want is measurable change. In 2020, we saw lots of businesses make very vague statements about inclusion and diversity and race. I don't want that. I want dates. I want percentages. I want budgets. I want them to be public and then we can measure against them. We can track and we can keep people accountable, which we can't do when they are just ephemeral ideas about inclusion. And the final thing that I want people to do is recognize that people from marginalized backgrounds are tired. It is exhausting. This work is exhausting. Being the unappointed face of everyone like you in a business, in a community is exhausting. If you are an ally, if this does not touch your skin directly, however tired you might think you are, you are less tired than someone who has to strategize and feel this every day of their lives. And so your job as an ally is to keep up the momentum. Your job is to keep the message strong. So we ran over a little bit because everything else also ran over. So I'm gonna hand back to the wider team and say thank you very much for having me today and for inviting me to be part of your session. I've really enjoyed it and I hope you have as well. Thank you so much, Sophie. I, I hope you can again join me in a round of applause for Sophie to thank her for the work that she has presented to us here today. She's given us some thinking around how we can actually make those ideas that we have in our head into actual real actions in our workplace. So thank you, Sophie. As you've noted, we don't have time to uh, move into a Q&A section. Um, there are questions in a couple of questions in the Q&A and we will bring them to Sophie uh, and perhaps reach out to you by email as a way of responding to your questions. So with that, I will pass it over to Asaya. Thank you so much, Sharon, and thank you so much, Sophie. Um, what an incredible presentation. I think just the simplicity is really, I think, what really hammers at home. Um, when I first met you before this session, um, I decided to kind of go home and read through your book, and it really is just so clear and so grounding and a lot of um, statements and comments that I, I truly, truly resonate with. So thank you so much. I'm sure everyone learned so much. Um, and thank you to all of our other speakers, to Mavis, Nikki, and Samir, and everyone who joined us today for being a part of such an essential discussion. Whether you are a participant or a witness, I hope that the information that was shared today will really help um, you move forward in your workplaces in a really beautiful way and act as support for those surrounding you. 
Thank you to the SFU Public Square and Resilience BC teams for all of their hard work on organizing this event and to Accurate Real Time for providing closed caption and to our translators, our live ESL translators who have stayed with us um, through this whole process. Thank you so much, interpreters. Stay tuned for a follow-up email with the recording and other resources from this event. And once again, thank you so much all for joining us today. Masalama, have a great afternoon or evening. <laughs> Bye.